I don't think life has any inherent meaning. And to try to define meaning in some universal or objective way, uh, I think we don't have any basis for that. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, times when I worked in a neonatal intensive care unit and I saw very deformed babies born who were not going to live long, yet heroic efforts were spent to keep these children alive, suffering as if that had meaning, and I never could come to that opinion. So, in terms of uh, the larger issue of uh, meaning, I think we're very uh, uh, evolved to acting as a unified organism to adapt. That's part of our uh, built-in nature. And in order to do this, I think we have to have some sort of myth or belief that, uh, that gives us meaning, but oftentimes that is very problematic because people can prematurely foreclose on meaning glomming onto any number of belief systems, whether it be a traditional religious belief system or whatever. And to me, in my own life, uh, I strive very much to keep open-ended and uh, suffer even with the, uh, uh, the ambiguity of living without a set meaning. And to me, that opens up horizons of possibility and creativity and uh, excitement, but it also doesn't buffer me from the tragedies, as if uh, I were to vest myself in a belief in an afterlife or some enlightenment or other common belief system that imbues me. Thank you, Faith Bill. Hunter Singer, the song, The Secret of Life. The secret of Life is there ain't no secret. And you don't get your money back. <laughs> it's a wonderful song. It's also in my talk tomorrow. I hope no one shows up at my talk tomorrow. <laughs> I think that's your desire to impose meaning on my experience. observation that the babies were suffering and deformed and your hypothesis that because of that the heroic attempts to keep them alive were perhaps counterproductive. And those are all comments about the intrinsic meaning of the situation. I mean, you can't act without intrinsic meaning. You act towards something all the time and to the degree that you're acting towards something you accept the meaning structure. You might not know what the meaning structure is, but as long as you're walking forward and acting, you're inside one. So, it, I, I can't see how both parts of your argument can be right. You can't act and not have an intrinsic meaning system. It's not possible. I think you're embracing the paradox. And I'm thinking of William James and his early struggle to 
position himself in relationship to the dilemma of free will versus determinism. And he anguished over that decision, and finally in despair he gave up and he affirmed free will and said, this affirmation is my first act of free will and retroactively proves my case. I think that type of circular reasoning is inherent in what you're proposing. For you, perhaps, meaning is unavoidable, but uh, the other possibility is that when people engage in evil, as you so eloquently uh, uh, presented in your talk earlier, perhaps uh, there's no meaning in that at all, and perhaps uh, that would be a counter-argument for your position. Sorry, I, you know, there's a bunch of things that are wrong with that, and they're even technically wrong. In the first case, we already know that you can't even perceive the world without looking at it from within meaning structure. Give me a quick example. Most of you have seen the Invisible Gorilla video, I presume. There's a video that's online, it's very famous. Uh, it involves a basketball game. A gorilla walks into the middle of the basketball game and no one notices it. And believe me, it's visible. The reason no one notices it is because they've been instructed to count the balls. The meaning of the perceptual acts is to count the balls and they miss the gorillas. You're a limited capacity process. When you look at the world, you look at it with intent. There's no way around that because you have to specify your perception. And so if you don't understand what intent guides your perception, that doesn't mean it isn't there. So that's the first thing. And that's, as far as we're concerned from a psychological perspective, that's as bloody well close to fact as you're going to get. Next thing, with regards to evil. We had the Nuremberg trials in 1940, whenever it was, 47, 46, something like that. We decided that what happened with the Nazis when they were conducting their evil activities was in fact meaningful. The meaning was bad, wrong. And the judgment, the Nuremberg judgment was, you don't get to do that, period. It's actually wrong. Now, you don't have to believe that. And I'm not asking you to believe it. But uh, it is worthwhile considering the consequences of not believing that. It's really worth considering the consequences of not believing that. And so that's an absolute statement of morality, by the way. That is wrong. As soon as you've got what's wrong, you've also got what's right. It just happens to be the opposite of what's wrong. Now you can see it's exciting to see the extent. But, <laughs> but this conversation will continue uh, after the conference because I'm going to set up a wiki page so that so the parents can, you can carry on the debate and hopefully a book uh, will emerge and they will flag different uh, ideas from different standpoints and then we come to uh, I'm going to impose the, the next half of you from my friend Ryan because I'm going to try to hold it because I don't want to pay much attention to Franco's influential work. That is basically one of the basic tenets of the therapy of meaning is freedom of choice. The capacity for free choice the key to being what you want. You can choose like a slave to do what it's told. Everyone agree that that I mean. So you want a slave to remain until you can. You know what that I mean. You long for the liberty, the freedom of choice, and self-determination in the key. Okay, that's the whole authority. Self-determination. Thank you, Paul. I have no idea what I'm about to say. Because <laughs> I'm stimulated in many directions by the thoughts that have already been said. Um, but I'm just going to begin, I think I'm going to begin the same way you did, which was personally, which is when I grew up, I had very strong belief systems, but I also had very difficult uh, developmental uh, early upbringings in my siblings. And we all took different directions in that. But one day, I was, I had an epiphany. The epiphany was that everything that had been handed to me might not be true. And there were a lot of truths that had been handed to me that I had internalized or interjected in some way and taken on as a way of organizing the world around me. And when I realized that they might not be true, everything came into question. Everything came into question. And it happened at that time. I, you know, I was not an intellectual in any way, shape, or form. I was pretty much just a, a party kid. And uh, 
But nonetheless, this epiphany struck me hard, and I went looking for some answer to that. And I found a book by Camus that consists of books, the opening line of which is um, something about uh, the only important philosophical question is whether life is worth living. And I thought it's true, but I have no damn answer for that at all. I don't know whether it's worth living. And I need to figure out what makes it worthwhile, if it is indeed worthwhile, because that's an open question to me. I don't feel like it's a, in a similar way, I'm not sure that it's a closed question. Maybe it's not meaningful. So if there's any meaning, I was going to have to construct it. I was going to have to find it of my own and see if in my heart it mattered to me. Now it's turned out over time, I found many meaningful things in life that I know in my heart are good and meaningful to me. My over 30 year marriage to my wife, who is not attending this, so she doesn't want to hear me talk about the meeting right now. <laughs> She's next door. <laughs> um, uh, you know, my children, who I love very deeply, who I have a very authentic relationship with that's based on truth telling and being honest with each other. Those things are deep and those are wonderful things, and they make my life worthwhile. But I also think, well, that's just my answer. That's just the things that I've discovered as I've tromped around in the world trying to find out what matters, what doesn't matter. And I see other people have some other answers. Some people are putting in answers that are the ones that they swallowed early on and never rose above to question. I think everybody should question those things that they've swallowed all because when you come to the other side of it, maybe you discover something new. But I also think we've asked them, you know, thousands and thousands of people I'm about to give up keynote in a bit, so I won't, you know, presage all of that, but, you know, people say some pretty common things when they come down to what really is meaningful, the most common being relationships. So I just want to say one more thing about relationships, which is, there's something that's really satisfying about giving to other people and caring for other people. There's something in that that is so deeply satisfying that it kind of trumps everything else I've personally discovered in life. That when you can be authentically helpful to another human being and help them flourish, that itself feels good. And then that produces a conundrum, which is a really interesting conundrum, which is if our meaning is always about the flourishing of the other, which to me is one of the deepest meanings, there's a regressive element it's also got to be the case that our life is in itself worthwhile and intrinsically valuable in this moment, independent of all the generative and other things. And so I think I try and keep a polarity or dialect between both of these things, between being oriented toward the generativity that feels so internally satisfying, but also trying to find moments which just in themselves, just the mere fact of existing and the wonder of existence, leaves me all. That feels painful to me. That's that's my spontaneous uh, aimless. <laughs>